Hello everyone, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with Eye Contact's Elevate Your Game uh, from Basic Blaster's Sophisticated Email Marketing Webinar today. So just kind of moving forward uh, with the uh, kind of housekeeping items uh, that we have for today. Uh, just so you guys will know, we're going to have a you know short question and answer session at the end of this presentation. So definitely you know keep track of your questions, and you can even submit them uh, via the uh, chat uh, portion of the uh, go to webinar today. If we can uh, facilitate those afterwards. If you have any audio issues, be sure to dial the number you see in front of you. Uh, and right after the webinar, we're gonna you'll receive an evaluation form. We definitely want your feedback. We want to know your thoughts. Uh, what did you like? What did you not like? Uh, we definitely take that to heart and try to improve and build upon that for you guys moving forward. Uh, and also look for a follow-up message, which is going to include a recording of this webinar. Uh, and that'll be in the coming days that you can then share, you know, with your folks, uh, so you can really take some of the. Uh, you know, best practices uh, that you're going to see today. So welcome to Elevate Your Game webinar. In just a minute, we're going to be talking about, like I said, the basic blast, sophisticated email marketing, and pretty much everything in between. Uh, allow me to thank everyone who is joining uh, the webinar live today. Uh, as was already mentioned, this webinar is going to be recorded. It will be shared with you guys uh, in just a couple of coming days after we kind of fine tune some audio for you. Uh, so I'm Chris Ostroka, Services Team Lead here at iContact, and I'll be your uh, MC. My job is pretty much to help customers get the most out of their email marketing strategy. Um, it's a rule I take very seriously, uh, which is why I'm excited to present this topic alongside Zach today. Uh, so how can I work smarter? Uh, this is the type of question we get all the time here at Eye Contact, uh, and the answer depends really on where you're currently standing in your marketing planning process. Uh, because when it comes to the various stages of the email maturity skill, there's really no bad place to be. Uh, all email marketers have to start somewhere, and to go on to the next level, you really just need the right product and the expert direction to take you there faster. So as you're listening to the webinar today, decide where you want, where you stand now. Uh, ask yourself, what will it take for me to graduate to the next stage? Perhaps it's just a little more pre-planning or trying out a more advanced product. Whatever it takes to get you more results, Eye Contact has something for you. Uh, and then after this session, I invite each of you to reach out to your strategic advisor or your account executive and you know, get that conversation going about moving towards that goal. It's what we're here for, after all. Uh, so why have we asked Zach Watson from Technology Advice to present to you today? Uh, we understand that finding the right digital solutions can be a huge undertaking. To make the research process much easier, Zach and his team at Technology Advice provide user reviews, original research, and expert guidance in one place. They're kind of like matchmakers for buyers and sellers of business tech. Zach serves as one of the marketing operations analysts, and it's his job to know the latest trends in the world of email marketing and marketing automation. He'll explore the typical email marketer's evolution from using an email service provider to automating with a full-service marketing platform. And with that, Zach, uh, take it away. Great. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> thanks for that introduction, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Like Chris said, we're going to be talking about how to elevate your email marketing game uh, from basic blast to sophisticated marketing. And the most important thing that we're going to talk about in this webinar, really kind of the recurring theme, is that good marketing blends technology and strategy. So you need both. What does this mean for marketers? So it means that marketing technology has exploded in the past decade. You know, we all know that. We know there's a multitude of software solutions for social media, for pay-per-click, for content management, and, uh, you know, relevant to what we're talking about today for email marketing and marketing automation. So the implications of this evolution of technology is that, um, you know, as marketers, we have better reporting and analytics. So as software becomes more sophisticated, we're able to record more of what happens and respond better. That also means we need to develop skills uh, with the technology. So we need people in-house, and we ourselves need to be familiar with how to use these solutions. And lastly, uh, it means that we can scale. So, you know, in the, in the past decade, 15 years ago, the kind of things we'll be talking about today with email automation, and marketing automation were really only available to you know larger companies, Fortune 500 companies who could either create their own um, you know their own solution in house, or who are working with a few massive companies to create really proprietary solutions in partnership with the company. We can do that you know now with uh, solutions like Eye Contact and a lot of other really nice uh, software solutions. We can do that. We have the ability to scale um, you know at a mid market or even small business level. So this means our marketing strategy has to adapt too. 
So we have to adapt to the new possibilities um, for uh, our customers, right? So we have an increased, an increased under ability to understand them based on, the, on more data. And we also have the ability to use this data to create the most personalized marketing in history. So it's not an exaggeration. Um, it's not really hyperbole. We'll get into why that's possible and, and, uh, and how we can make that happen a little bit later. But this also means that our, you know, our customers' expectations have changed. If you think about the way that some of the most important businesses of our time are working, whether that's Amazon.com specifically, or places like TripAdvisor, um, you know, even Airbnb, they're using automation to personalize the way they communicate with customers to an unheard of degree. So this means that our audiences now have a lower threshold for irrelevant content and irrelevant communication, and it's up to us to adjust our strategies to respond. And so you need both. So complex technology won't fix, you know, flawed application. It won't fix a bad strategy. Um, and, you know, an amazing strategy won't reach anyone with the right technology. We're, we're in a bit of a different place here than, you know, it, you see marketers in the past where if you're doing a direct mail campaign or if you're doing um, some other type of campaign, the best strategy would always win. Now, it's a, a lot of it is um, the best technology wins too. You still need strategy, but you need that technology aspect to make sure that you're getting in front of the right audience. And so when we talk about email marketing maturity, we're talking about the measurement of your application of strategy and technology, which is why we're talking about, you know, the email marketing maturity model, which is right here. So you can see that we'll go through today the five different stages, starting with Bash and Blast, um, which is pretty primitive, and then all the way up to full-blown marketing automation. And so why are we talking about email marketing maturity specifically? Well, one is because this is an eye contact webinar, so this makes sense. The other is that email still has a ton of business value. It's, just, it's one of the best mediums for driving leads. So you can see from this uh, the statistic, which is I took from Salesforce's 2015 um, State of Marketing Survey, that 60% of, of respondents of marketers said that email is a critical enabler of our products and services, which is an 18% increase in 2014, so almost a 20% increase. And that just goes to show you um, how relevant, how powerful email still is. You know, of course, there's always, an, it seems like there's always a new social media channel, you know, every quarter, every couple of months, one springs up. But, you know, email has been with us for quite a long time. And um, it's personal by design. It's one-to-one. -one. You know, I think we all know that. And this, and this just shows how powerful this medium still is. So we'll be talking about, you know, a number of more sophisticated uh, more complex email techniques throughout this webinar, but really at the core of, what we, of everything we talk about is that effective email utilizes the detailed segmentation, it adapts to audience behavior, and it keeps evolving with testing. So those three things are really the foundation of, uh, of email automation and, and really even marketing automation, and they're, and they're going to be at the heart of everything that we talk about today. So here's how we get there. Here's how we get to those three pillars of email marketing all the way up to marketing automation and, uh, and email automation. So the first stage, uh, well, we batch and blast here, is, is the first stage in the, in the email maturity model. And we see that um, batch and blast is really composed of, uh, I suppose you'd call them strategies. It's, it's difficult to call them strategies, but they're, you know, they're one-off emails with random send times without any consistency. Um, this leaves people really questioning, you know, what, what's going on? Why is this happening to me? Um, there's no segmentation, so everyone gets the same email. Everyone gets essentially the same email. Most everyone hates that, and I'll show you a statistic in a second that shows why. And, uh, and then people at this stage are really just passively adding emails. Um, they, they may or may not be using an opt-in process. And they're really just grabbing emails from whatever source they can. And uh, that leaves audiences wondering how to get here. So, you know, I mean, you guys know about batch and blast emails. You know essentially where it came from. Um, but, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when email marketing was still new and novel, people would get away with batching blast email because receiving an email was still, um, you know, a unique experience. But here, you know, the graphic shows now our, our inboxes are all really full and, um, you know, receiving untargeted emails really isn't that exciting anymore. It's, uh, it's actually incredibly annoying. And so, you know, that doesn't work and people hate it. This, this statistic is from a study that uh, we at Technology Advice conducted. Um, we surveyed adult consumers in North America and we asked them, why, why do you, uh, flag emails as spam. So, you know, the highest answer is that people email them too often. So, sending frequency would be a big deal. Test that, obviously. Um, you know, if you're in the batch and blast stage, you're not concerned about that. 
Second is that they didn't purposely subscribe, which kind of refers to the passively adding um, emails or the lack of opt-in process. Uh, like I said, email is personal. You know, people are, it's jarring when you get email in your inbox and you don't know where it came from. And then, you know, the third, the third answer was that uh, people send them irrelevant content. So, again, if that gets to the heart of what we're talking about today with automation and, uh, and personalization, is that we want to try to send the most relevant content possible. And, you know, this isn't just um, unsubscribing. This is being marked as spam. So these are reasons that people will actually, you know, go out of their way to tell their email system, don't let this kind of email back in anymore. So Chris has a good example about uh, how eye contact helps um, with the customers get away from Batch and Blast a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Zach. And so one thing we're going to highlight today, uh, Zach is going through the various stages of uh, kind of the email maturity scale, is we're going to provide some examples for you. You can kind of see, like, how uh, we've helped different customers, uh, you know, who've come at different points in their cycle. And that's, you know, one thing definitely to keep in mind today is uh, you may be finding yourself in one of any of the cycles that Zach mentioned, uh, but, you know, you can definitely always move forward and advance. And that's, you know, what being with eye contact is all about and working with our premier services is moving from one stage to the next uh, so you can get the most out of your email marketing. So with this example, you know, customer coming aboard, uh, they lacked a lot of the key components. You know, it was that batch and blast mentality. The frequency was kind of all low over the place. It was kind of one off here, one off there. Uh, as you can see, there really wasn't any personalization to it. You know, they had an email address for the person and that was pretty much all they had in terms of from the opt-in process. Uh, and, you know, the content was just kind of out there. It wasn't really, uh, you know, targeting towards anybody or even segmented towards anybody. Uh, and so, you know, with this customer, that was really the focus was, okay, let's get on a, you know, a consistent sending frequency. Let's getting on, uh, start to personalize it in ways, you know, that we can do today with only having the email address. Um, so, you know, this was a great starting ground and kind of the great thing about this was they were sending content, right? They had the available content. That, that so often is such a hard thing of what do I even send? First, start sending content, like utilizing what you have available to you, because you have to get in the practice of with email, you're going to have to regularly send information to your folks, and you can't just randomly do it when it's convenient or, uh, you know, uh, a good solution for you at the time. Yeah, so moving on um, from Batch and Blast, we, we, we're into uh, stage two, which is basic segmentation. And basic segmentation is essentially what it sounds like. So, um, you know, it's usually you are using real segmentation. There is some type of segmentation going on. And it's usually customers versus non-customers. Um, you can also use email source is another common one. There's a couple of different ways um, to segment customers in a primitive way, which doesn't necessarily take into account um, you know, the customer's value to your organization or anything like that, but it is a step forward. Emails are optimized for mobile in this stage. So email content um, you know, is taking into consideration a view from a mobile experience which is important. We'll get, we'll get to why it's so important in a second, though. And then there's a newsletter. So there's some type of recurring uh, piece of content, email communication going out either weekly, biweekly, you know, or on a monthly basis, um, which really just shows your audience, look, you know, you're committed to this medium. You're going to keep sending them useful content. You know, you're a living, breathing um, company. And so, like I said, even basic segmentation is a huge step forward. So the audience benefits because they get, you know, more relevant email. And even if emails are slightly more relevant, that's so much better than just, uh, you know, one type off email, like Chris showed earlier, that doesn't take into consideration, um, you know, the customer at all. And so people will appreciate that more. You know, you get, they'll see that you're trying to send them um, things that are more targeted, and I think they'll understand what you're working towards. Uh, and it benefits you because it's actually relatively simple to target different audiences. So if you only have a couple of segments, it's not that difficult to set up a different, few different campaigns. And you can do some basic reporting. So you can easily see how one email worked with one audience versus how it worked with another. And, you know, most people get basic segmentation. Um, this is a survey from e-consultancy that came out earlier this year, which shows that 76% of respondents were, uh, were already using basic segmentation. And 15% were planning, were planning to do it in the next, I think, 12 months. Um, so that's going to push basic segmentation well into the 90s, you know, about 91%. And so it's really becoming, um, you know, utilized in every aspect of marketing. And like I mentioned earlier, um, mobile is, is, that is really important now. And it's, um, that's why it's so early in the email maturity model, because Venture B published a study earlier this year that said 65% of all emails are read first on a mobile device. 
Now, of course, that's just one survey. Um, you know, we're all savvy marketers, so we know that one survey isn't the whole truth. But, you know, there's multiple surveys that put the number of um, first reads on mobile devices well over 50. So many are close to 60, if not exceeding 60, like this particular survey was. And that means that we really have to take into account um, how our emails look on, on mobile devices. So phones are getting bigger, of course, but we still need to think about subject line length, email body copy, and a couple of other aspects that are going to make the experience um, nice for the user. And the good thing is that if you're using an email, uh, an email marketing platform like Contact or you know, pretty much any other email marketing platform that's worth your time, is going to have responsive templates, which takes all the, the coding and the different sizing um, aspects out of, out of your hands and really just takes care of it for you. So that leaves us as marketers, like I said, uh, the responsibility to think about the experience. So is subject line length, is this, you know, 50 word subject line going to work, um, 50 word, 50 character subject line going to work on a mobile device? Um, you know, is this 150 word uh, body copy going to work on a mobile device? These are things that we need to think about. And, you know, returning to the newsletter at this stage, the newsletter is good, um, you know, but it's not, it's not revolutionary by any means. The newsletter is um, pretty uh, tried and true from a email marketing standpoint. Um, so, you know, we see that when Salesforce asked, uh, in the same study that I mentioned earlier, when Salesforce asked people to rate the effectiveness of their email marketing campaigns, the newsletter got 66%. Um, which is, you know, 66% that 66 said it was very effective or, or at least effective. And that's a good, um, it's a decent number. But when we look at some of the more targeted personal things on here, like a transactional email, or a loyalty email, or emails from a welcome series. Um, you know, these are in the 70s, so these are pushing. Um, these, these are almost double digit better than email newsletters. So, you know, not to uh, not to beat up on the newsletter. It's necessary. Um, I think people find find it's very effective when it's done well, and it's an important piece to keep in touch with your audience. But it's not the most sophisticated type of marketing that we can do. Great points, uh, and you know, definitely highlighting you know the two biggest elements there that you know with uh, mobile is here and it's been here. So that's definitely you know big priority when you're actually building out your messages. You know, having a clear call to action. You have to keep in mind people are selecting with their finger. Uh, they don't have the luxury of using a small pointer mouse to do it. It's actually their finger. So is it a clear call to action like in this example here? Uh, you know, is are you incorporating things like a social presence because it's so easy to cross promote uh, across the you know the different platforms? Uh, of course, having your strong branding, balanced text to image ratio, these are all you know, really common things that you need to keep in mind when you're going about and building a uh, mobile-friendly, mobile-responsive template uh, or just message in general. Uh, and kind of on the back end, you know, the point I wanted to highlight is just the segmenting by you know, consumers. That's you know, really kind of in stage two, as that kind of mentioned, really starting to understand them a little bit better and kind of getting past just not doing just the one-off blast, moving past even the newsletter, and starting to kind of understand who you're actually sending this to. So in this particular instance, it was separating between, you know, more of a business-to-business -business versus business-to-consumer, and, you know, who is actually uh, receiving this message and what's their uh, intent with the message. So this is obviously going to uh, a B2C type uh, environment uh, to actually take a physical action to vote uh, on this particular uh, message that they were sending. Yeah, great example, Chris. It's a nice looking email. So stage three, we have advanced segmentation, which is uh, again just what it sounds like. So we, we've moved beyond just basic segmentation. So in a very you know primitive way, we're dividing up our audience to uh, dividing it by personas, right? So your audience is segmented by personas or your ideal customer, and then that email is targeted toward these personas. So you're marketing the different campaigns you're doing, take into account the needs of prospective customer segments. And then they play out they play out the needs and the pain points of those customer segments. In this stage, your email is also cross-channel, so that means that it's connected to social and other different mediums in effective ways. It's not just uh, share icons, so you're not just pushing content saying, "Oh yeah, look, we did this. So if you want to share it, that'd be great." Um, it's really thinking about holistic marketing campaigns. And then in this stage two and stage three, uh, in stage three, I should say, there's also some A/B testing. So I use the word dabbling here. Um, so, you know, people may be exper experimenting with A-B testing on a subject line level or a sending time level, um, but it's really not that advanced. And so, moving back to personas, I think that it's, it's important to take a, take a moment and really reflect on how we use personas in email. 
Um, there's a lot written about how to create personas and then how to use personas. Um, and I think that it can get com unnecessarily convoluted, uh, you know, any discussion about personas because it gets kind of gets in the weeds with all the different data points you need and all the different research you need to do. And I think that if we peel it back a little bit and we just think about defining your ideal customer, that's where we're going to get the most value out of personas. Just simply who, what groups or group is most valuable to your company? What characteristics make them that way? Is it because they're repeat subscribers? Is it because they have larger orders? Is it because, um, you know, perhaps they have a large family and they, um, they have a bunch of users in their household, or they have a bunch of customers in their household. What makes these customers um, important to your business? And so once you define who these customers are, you should talk to them. Um, I think the, I personally think the most powerful thing you can get out of personas, the most that's going to have the biggest effect on your marketing is to get direct quotes from people. So you know, as marketers, we use data to try to infer what uh, what our customers want. What a, our prospective customers want, so why do they do something on our website? You know, why do they do something in our email campaigns? We use data to try to figure these things out. Well, if you just ask someone um, and get direct quotes from them, they will just tell you, Zach, well, this is what I like about your company. I thought you guys did this great, and that's why I became a customer. You know, and it's also, you can follow up with people that didn't become customers uh, or canceled, you know, a membership or what have you. You know, and they'll say, Zach, uh, this wasn't working for me anymore. You changed this, I didn't like that, or you know, you did this from the beginning, I never understood why. Finding these things out are, are just going to accelerate your marketing. It's going to push it forward a great deal because you just understand that, okay, my ideal, my ideal customers feel this way about this. I have to fix that or I have to play, I have to market to that need. And once we understand that, then, then we've really, you know, we've really made some significant progress. Then we, we can create content specifically for them. You know, we can find out their favorite medium. Um, we can look at data to see, are they on YouTube more? Are they on Pinterest more? Sharing a lot of infographics, things like that. Are they on our blog a lot? And do they like to read? Or do they like podcasts? Um, you know, that, that's coming back as a medium. So once we understand that, then we have to, we have to do our Jedi training. We have to become um, experts on their favorite subjects and create content for that, for that persona. Um, and then we send them that content, right? We divide our email marketing out based on the personas, and then we, we send them content that helps them make buying decisions. We create a series, you know, uh, filled with different subjects about um, content that these, these people are interested in and, uh, and, and try to move them along a little bit. And so that's, in a nutshell, um, I mean, that's really how you use personas in email. It's not easy. I mean, it does take some legwork, especially, you know, it, I, I would recommend taking taking a good deal of time to define who your ideal customer is, and then taking some time to, to talk to them too. Um, but it, it's going to pay off in the end. And so who uses personas? Um, you know, how widespread is, is this type of technique? This is a study from VentureBeat. Um, this is the sampling of a study that VentureBeat did of marketing automation users. And so, uh, you know, you can see that 18%, almost 19% are segmenting primarily by personas, whereas 40% uh, are segmenting primarily by segments which are, you know, that's a little bit um, less advanced kind of stuff we talked about in uh, stage two. And then about 30% are doing both. So if we add the 30% with the 18%, we're getting close to 50% uh, to of marketers using, or at least marketing automation users, uh, segmenting by persona. So, you know, it's becoming a more popular technique, um, but it's still got a lot of room to grow. And so in this stage, we also talked about uh, using email as a holistic marketing strategy. Um, you know, having share icons in there and trying to get your content pushed from email to social, um, using email as a distribution mechanism for your content isn't a terrible idea. I mean, people, you know, people will do that. But if we look at what Chubby's does here, this could be much more effective. Um, so you can see the social ad that Chubby's trying to get people to vote for them um, to be in the Super Bowl, and they need to do by November 3rd. Well, at the bottom, this is, a, this is some copy from email I, I received from them which they'll send out emails to just say, have a nice weekend. Um, there's some funny graphics or a GIF in it, which is not a bad idea. I always open those and read those. But at the bottom of one email that they sent me, um, they asked me to vote for them to be in the Super Bowl. And so that shows that they're not just doing social in a vacuum, and they're not just using email in a vacuum. They're thinking of ways to connect, uh, to connect these different mediums. And that's really the basis of cross-channel. You know, how can we interact with our customers on, on different mediums that drive them toward the same result? 
and as far as A-B testing goes, um, you know, A-B testing is, uh, is usually happening at this stage on a subject line level or ascending time level, which can, this can have, a, you know, a big impact on, on the effectiveness of your email and the engagement you get in your email. But, you know, they're not the most complex things to be testing. Um, so you can see Business Guy here is more dreaming about A-B testing than actually doing it. Um, you know, he had an epiphany here when he drank his coffee and he realized that, uh, you know, the company should be A-B testing. So as Zach was mentioning, uh, in terms of the advanced segmentation and really finding out, you know, where your audience is and the appropriate medium to reach them. So in this example here, uh, you know, you can see across multiple channels how it looks very similar, but, you know, as you kind of break them down a little further, you can understand, like, how it was targeted for the same type of message and, you know, to their audience. So first they had to figure out, you know, who their audience is and define them, uh, and they've definitely done a great job of that. Uh, as they're, you know, going after the male subset uh, and also, you know, just active male subset. Uh, so that's why, you know, having someone like Tyson Chandler be a spokesman for the brand and a face of the brand really works, especially because they have so many uh, beard products and he has, a, you know, a great beard uh, to, you know, show off those products. Uh, so you can see, you know, all the way to the left, the email portion of it, this video, you know, where you're actually seeing him, you know, come in and slam dunk the ball, taking you from the email to a landing page. The video is not actually living in the, the video is not living in the email. It goes to an actual landing page to see it. Uh, and so that's where uh, the email portion of this kind of comes in. That's where it started. That's where it stemmed from. That's where majority of their users actually were. Uh, and then, you know, moving over to Facebook, you have a lot of room there, but understanding that Facebook, you know, you're going to have the opportunity to share it. You're going to have the opportunity to, uh, you know, have other people exposed to it. If people like it um, or comment on it, that can be shown to other friends. So you really have to think about that and the sharing aspect of it uh, in that platform and understanding it in that purpose. Uh, and the great thing about it there is it can be watched in that medium, whether you're on mobile or on desktop, the video loads and plays right there in that environment. And then finally on Instagram, the video had to be tailored a little bit. One, for screen size. Uh, you know, Instagram is on desktop, but you just don't see that much usage of it there, it, you know, almost entirely on the mobile and uh, environment. And so with that, it also has a 15-second video length. So you have to make sure your videos are trimmed down. Also that it's, you know, HD quality. People are so used to seeing that now for, you know, specifically high, you know, uh, profile brands that they really want the best and expect the best. So you can see how... You know, what started on email to drive people, you know, to the website to look at, you know, what uh, is in Tyson Chandler's gym bag uh, and then took, you know, different forms and different phases across other multiple platforms uh, to convey the same message uh, to make sure that they're hitting folks who may be living on one platform and maybe not the other as well at the same time. Right. Great example. I love that copy. Try a better beard. It's great stuff. So uh, moving on from stage three to stage four, we are in email automation, which uh, this is the fun stuff. So we've gone over, you know, segmentation, essentially cross-channel, some, you know, some uh, more advanced middle of the funnel um, marketing techniques in stage two and stage three. But now we get to, uh, you know, email automation, which is the brand new stuff, stuff that where the technology is just now getting into and it's just being dispersed um, really across the market. So when we think about email automation strategies, we think about behavioral marketing. So that means our, our audience is segmented by their behavior as well as, you know, kind of their characteristics. So where we're in, the, in stage three, when we were segmenting to personas, our email was sending based on who someone was. Now in behavioral marketing or in email automation, we're sending based on who someone, who someone is and also what they've done. So our email campaigns, you know, really change with the customer's behavior and then move them closer to being customers. We do this with trigger-based emails. So like I said, certain emails um, will be sent based on behavior. It's also happens automatically. And we're also running, you know, we're usually running multiple A-B tests in this, uh, in this stage. So, you know, throughout multiple campaigns, we'll be testing a couple of different things. And then our test hypotheses are usually more complex than, uh, than just the subject line. So before we really examine and break down um, what an email automation campaign looks like and, and get into some very specific tactics, uh, I think it's important to kind of examine why we do this. So why do we nurture people, right? That's the, that's the entire purpose of an email uh, automation campaign, of a nurture campaign, of a drip marketing campaign. You'll hear it described several different ways. Um, and we do this because buyers use research to make decisions. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's not to say that the emotional purchase is dead, 
those are big ticket items, um, or even items, you know, experiential items. So if you're going on a vacation, you're going to stay in a hotel, go to a restaurant, things like that. People people look at reviews. Um, people want to use data to make their decisions because there's, obviously there's an, a wealth of it on the internet. So sometimes it can take them a while to convert, and people need to nurt, you know, they need to be nurtured through their buying process with content. And that's why we create educational content because when someone is trying to make a purchase decision, you know, they need they need to go somewhere to get the information. If we can isolate and target those people and create content again to the persona that answers the question that they're asking, they're going to trust our brand. And if we do that in a nurture campaign, if we consistently provide the right information throughout their buying process, hopefully they're going to choose our brand. We're going to be in a much better position than someone who's not doing that. Because we'll walk them through their buying process, and then once they're ready to talk to a salesperson, um, I mean, it's the next logical step. So that's really why these campaigns are becoming more popular, that email automation software is becoming more popular, because it's really just the technology adjusting um, to the way that consumers behave. And that goes back to the entire you know, kind of concept of this webinar is that to, to thrive as marketers, um, we have to combine technology and strategy. So this is what uh, you know, a drip campaign looks like. That's my, that's my favorite term for it, speaking in short. Um, this is a drip campaign that we used, we used at uh, technologydevice.com. And you can see there on the left the way that things are automated. So it's pretty simple, actually. So you can, send the, you can see the different emails that we send. You can see the pauses for the different days. So that's the automation aspect. So we pause four days in between the first one, three days in between the second one. And then you can see the trigger email. You can see there's step number five. Um, you know, there's a yes, no step, which I'll describe as if-then logic, which essentially means if this happens, then this happens. So we'll get back into that in, in, in just a second. But some of the rules that you want to want to use when you build a lead nurturing campaign or a drip, a drip campaign is to always use context. So if someone's giving you their email, um, we need to think about when we start sending them emails. We need to think about the action they just took. So, what was the what was the previous action that led to them converting and giving us their their information? How do we become? How do we stay as relevant as possible to what just happened? Because that is the last data point we have. We know that that's what piqued their interest enough to make an exchange with our business to exchange their information for whatever value they they received in return. And when you, when you build these campaigns, you should make them conversational. And I don't, that doesn't mean um, the tone of your copy. That means think about these, these campaigns as a back and forth. So when you send someone an email, you're asking them a question. If they click on that email, then they're nodding their head and saying yes, okay, yes to your question. So think about it as a back and forth there. And always try to, try to build the campaign in a way that sends content like it would in a conversation. So if someone asks you a question, or you ask someone a question and then they say yes, what would you say next? I think that'll help keep it relevant. And then always think about the buyer. So um, you know, with great res with great power comes great responsibility. So it's very easy to build some incredibly uh, complex and powerful email automation campaigns um, and kind of and kind of get caught up in the the um, abilities, the capabilities of the software. But it's always important to remember that we do this for the buyer. We do this to make their experience better, and we do this to educate them. So here's, here's let's break down the, uh, the campaign. So here's the first email that we send them in the, uh, in the automation campaign. And it's important to get some context here first, because we'll understand that better, that'll kind of um, explain why we sent this particular email. So on technologyadvice.com, um, when we help people find business technology, we have, a, we have a, an online application called the Product Selection Tool. So people can come to our website, and they can answer a series of questions, and then they'll get recommended um, you know, a couple of products that meet their needs based on you know, what the price range is, or the number of users, what have you. And when they do that, they can opt in to receive more content when they get their recommendations. And so everyone that's come to this gamification campaign has opted, has filled out the Product Selection Tool and opted to receive more content. So what that, that means a couple of things. It means, one, we know they're in the product phase because they, um, they were searching for products on our website. So they're probably closer to the end of, the, uh, of, their, of their buyer's journey. You know, they're, they're not identifying a problem. They're, they're looking for a solution, and a particular solution, too. So that also means that they didn't convert. So the, uh, the recommendations we sent them 
um, actually weren't what they're looking for. So that could mean a couple of things. It may, it may mean they don't understand their needs quite as much as they think, or it may mean they just need more information. So there could be the correct uh, solutions in that initial set, but they just need to learn more. And so <laughs> that's a great deal of context that informs why we send this email. So this email goes to a, a, um, to a blog post, which is essentially a decision tree. So you can see the graphic there it illustrates that um, if you're choosing, you know, if you have this need, then choose this group of software. If you have this need, then choose this group of software. And this aligns, you know, this aligns with uh, all our rules. So it's incredibly relevant because it talks about products when we know someone is exactly in the product, product saves. It's conversational. So if someone came and asked me about, about gamification products, I would say, okay, here, use this, uh, you know, use this decision tree to, to find out what you need. And that, both those things put the buyer front and center. So the decision tree, we don't ask them to download it. It's just on the blog. So we're just giving them something. We're just trying to help them and put them first. Now, the second email is, uh, is about niche recommendations. So if the first two pieces of content we've sent them, like the product collection tool didn't work for them, and then the decision tree didn't work for them, it's time to, to, to kind of dig a little deeper and say, okay, well, do you need something that's very specific for your needs? So what about small business? So here are five gamification platforms for small business. And that just, you know, we're trying to dig a little deeper and trying to help them answer their questions, which essentially, which product is right for me? And so that, again, it uses the context that we know. It's, a, it's, a, it's a information about products. It's conversational because if someone came to me and I said, okay, have you used the product selection tool? Have you used this um, decision tree? Check off both those boxes. And if they're still saying, okay, I don't, I don't have what I need, I would say, okay, well, do you have a special need? Are you an SMB? So that, that's where the conversational piece comes into play. And it really helps, it really helps you build out your logic for these campaigns. It really helps you decide well, what should you send next. And of course, you know, we're still thinking about the buyer. Now, here's where the triggered emails come into play. If someone clicks on that second email, um, this is going to initiate a little branch, so a mini drip campaign. As we can see there, it's, uh, it's based on if-then logic, which proposes a scenario and then an action. So if this happens, then this happens. And that's how people send triggered emails. Um, yeah. And so the, to follow up on the previous action, that's the, that's the first email we send. So we basically send more information about the products they read about in that SMB article. Um, and, you know, in the email, we link to different product pages. So at Technology Advice, we also have uh, pages about each specific product that talk about, you know, um, pricing for that product, the number of features. You can watch a review video or sign up for a free trial. And this makes total sense to follow up the uh, SMB article with. So if they clicked on the SMB article and didn't convert there, we can say, all right, well, based on um, you know, your, your previous action, we think that you'll, you'll want to learn more about these products. So here is a link to our, um, our product pages. Now, if that's you know, if that doesn't work or if someone reads that and still hasn't converted again, then we can assume, well, maybe they just need more information about different products. We'll provide a deeper perspective. What's in the buyer's guide on gamification, which will actually try to educate them on how to buy gamification because they've, now they've looked at several products and um, you know, several groups of products, really, and they still haven't made a decision. So let, let, let's see if they need some help um, putting together a decision-making process. And so this guy contains case studies. It contains product rankings by our analysts. And, you know, it's essentially just loads of additional value. Now, they've gone through the first two emails, the first two triggered emails, which are really um, based on their action of clicking on the SMB article. These two emails are pretty targeted. They're essentially as targeted as we can get. If these two things still haven't um, helped them find what they need, then the last email that gets triggered is to uh, schedule a time with uh, one of our salespeople. So it can be a 15-minute Q&A session where you just talk to a salesperson and tell them, hey, you know, what, what do you need? Um, what are you looking for? We'll just have an expert help you out. And that, um, you know, that, that goes back to the conversational aspect. So if, uh, if, I, if I tried to help this person um, find different, the different products they, they need and it's still not working, I would have interested, okay, well, let's go talk to an expert about it. And that's where this, this piece comes in. So there are, there are two types of triggered emails, as you just saw, the immediate reaction one, which is, um, you know, right after someone clicks on something, the next email they receive, uh, that action takes them down a different branch, and then they start to receive a series of emails based on that one reaction. Or lead scoring, 
um, which is something we'll learn more about in, in stage five of full blown marketing automation. Um, but so using triggered emails is still still in its infancy. Um, you know, only about 20% of the market is using them right now based on the e-consultancy study. But if we look, there's 39% of the market that's saying we plan on doing this in the next 12 months. So um, that's going to push triggered emails close to 60% of the market using them. So this, you know, there's still a uh, big opportunity there, but it, it's catching on pretty quickly because people understand how targeted it is. They understand that when we when we use triggered emails, we're using marketing that adapts to the behavior of our customers. And so if the if those triggered emails don't convert, you know, the prospect will continue on through the drip campaign. Um, the next the next email they get will be enterprise gamification, which addresses a whole other topic. So if you either if you clicked on the SMB article and didn't um, didn't convert on any of the three triggered emails, or if you didn't click on the SMB article at all, we can assume, okay, perhaps that wasn't what you were looking for. Um, you know, maybe you're not an SMB. Maybe you need enterprise gamification. It's a, a type of software for a big company. So we just we're just trying to check another box off the list and, and, and work through all of the different qu questions that a, a software buyer could have, um, you know, at the, at the end of their buying cycle. And like I said before, uh, the reason we do this stuff and the reason this stuff is so powerful is because triggered emails are a way to build marketing that adapts to the behavior of your audience at scale. So, you know, we can set up these rules and these can, th then these things will continue to happen across our entire audience, um, which is really fascinating. And, and, and that's what I was referring to earlier when I said that we're able to create some of those personalized marketing in history. It's not the most personalized marketing in history because we no longer have to assume at this at this point, um, we can take someone's action, we can see what they've done, and we can send them something directly targeted to what based on um, you know the interest they just expressed, and that's and that's incredible. You know that's that's something that is really new for marketing, where it's not you know this kind of assumption based on creativity. It's a uh, you know it's a process based on data, and that's that's at the core of what email market email automation and, and marketing automation are about. And so while we're doing this, you know, while we're creating our, our, our drip campaigns and our, uh, our triggered emails, another thing that's important too is the test. So, you know, we don't want to assume. Um, we want to we make the most educated decisions as possible. So this comes into what I was talking about earlier where we're testing something more complex than the subject line. So I think instead of just testing sending time, testing different aspects of an email, right, so essentially the same concept but uh, framed differently, or sent at a different time, I think it's important to test the actual concept. So for example, uh, in that first line of triggered emails, if we sent them information about the products they just read about in, in the SMB article, we should test that. We should have uh, an A-B test at that point that has something else, so an entirely different type of content that we send them to see which people find more relevant. Because you know, as marketers, um, it's easy to think that we know what, what's most relevant for prospects, that we have the data, we can make, you know, we can make a very educated guess, a very strong assumption, um, but we could be wrong. And so that's why AB, this is where A-B testing becomes really, really powerful, is when uh, you're using it to display two different versions of reality to your audience and let your audience choose. That's, that's what's going to be the end result of the A-B test. So instead of, at this point, instead of, you know, kind of testing a subject line and it comes down to, well, does someone like this word rather than that word, your audience is choosing and saying, no, we prefer this content to this content, which is, which is huge. And that really elevates you to this uh, to cat status, you know, where you get to wear a bow tie and glasses and sit around in the lab. So I think that's something that we can all strive for. And one thing I really wanted to highlight uh, that Zach was just mentioning was, you know, that using the data to uh, drive, you know, a big part of behavioral marketing and kind of at segmentation levels. So, you know, coming aboard this particular example here, uh, as you can see, there's a, kind of a lot going on with a particular message, you know, big hero image at the top, smaller ones along the way, and some other hero images down at the bottom. And what we were trying to figure out was where was the engagement, right? What were people clicking on? What were they not clicking on, you know, uh, with different subject lines? What were people opening and not opening so with hundreds of thousands of contacts you know you can start to compile a lot of data and really start to understand you know where's the growth where are the trends uh, what can we actually look at to better understand and to ultimately better serve 
the contacts that we're sending to to send them relevant content. So are they into action movies? Are they into love stories? Uh, do they open emails more when sent on a Thursday versus on a Friday? So different variables like that led us to the next slide where we actually uh, built out, you know, a more targeted aspect. So this is, you know, moved into more of those drip campaigns that Zach was mentioning, and you know, the workflows that we have uh, in iContact Pro, where we began to segment based on engagement. So if you, the if and if and then scenario. So if you did do this, you'd be sent this. On top of that, this is a brick and mortar uh, type environment, along with you know e-commerce. So they have a lot of data uh, that we imported based on concession purchase history, you know tickets, merchandise, different things like that. We were able to bring in and kind of marry those two together. So now all of a sudden we have this robust amount of data that we're looking at, so we can build these campaigns. Uh, that you know is a fair amount of work to set up, but then once it's set up, there's a lot of the work is being done. And you know as we mentioned at the beginning, we're working smarter uh, in this environment. So now we're split testing on frequency, subject line, time of day, and as you can see here by the arrows, simple as things as content to really understand, you know, what is uh, driving engagement for this particular eye contact customer, you know, where uh, and what uh, and when, you know, all the W's basically uh, will make it happen for this uh, particular uh, customer. Yeah, cool example, great one there with a uh, brick and mortar shop. So. Now, guys, we've made it. Um, now we're at stage five. Uh, we're at the, the zenith of the email marketing maturity model uh, mountain. Yes, it did just add another M to that, that title. Um, and so in this stage, we're going to talk about a lot of things that essentially move beyond email marketing um, because it's you know, a full-blown marketing automation um, strategy, and it really integrates marketing and sales. So sales, they almost become one department. Um, you know, and this, this is really a lot of operational stuff, so this is maybe realigning your department a little bit to work more closely with sales, um, you know, agreeing with sales on certain things that need to happen in the, in the process, and, and these are the three main things that we'll talk about in this, uh, in this section. Um, one is lead scoring. So, you know, sales and marketing agree on the importance of actions that, that uh, your prospects take on, in your drip campaigns and on your website. And so this assigns points to different, different prospects on an individual basis based on the actions they take. So if I go and, you know, look at a pricing page, uh, that should be, you know, significantly more points than if I just go and look at a, a blog post. And um, we also think about CRM integration. We're talking about full-blown uh, marketing automation. So sales and marketing have connected their two systems. And so this helps them build a single view of the customer profile. So there's not, this is, this is about breaking down data silos. So there's not one version of, the, of, of, of a, you know, Charles Xavier in the CRM, the sales CRM, and another version of Charles Xavier in the marketing automation system. There's one unified profile that exists in both systems. And there's also the lead flow process. So, you know, sales and marketing agree on the different stages the OE travels through. So what happens throughout the buyer's journey, um, you know, from, from the organizational standpoint, from the operational standpoint, what is sales doing at a certain stage? What is marketing doing at a certain stage? These, these, uh, this process is agreed upon between the two departments. So like I said, um, marketing automation, you know, true full-blown marketing automation is more than email. So it's a, a strategic and operational alignment of, uh, of sales and marketing. And that means that marketing and sales have to agree, um, which may seem impossible, but it's not. Uh, you know, you can make it happen. We're making it happen. Um, it's a goal that everyone should be working towards. And it starts with system integration. So, you know, like I said, marketing and sales seem to have the same view as the customer. So it's really important to integrate your CRM and marketing automation platform. So that means that marketing can kind of control the prospects that are, are just, you know, maybe looking at blog posts that aren't ready to go to sales. And sales can only deal with leads once they've, once they've done something that we think is sales worthy. So this means that, um, you know, someone who looks, looks at 10 blog posts isn't necessarily ready to go to sales. That, that's not sales um, indicative behavior. But if, if the two systems are integrated, that data can be lost. That kind of context about the profile can be lost. And so in this, you really handle system integration, um, you know, when you adopt marketing automation, uh, you probably have a, um, you know, an, an account manager or someone that helps you with this kind of stuff. And it's really... Um, usually taking care of a lot on the vendor side. 
Um, and so then sales and marketing have to agree about scoring and defining leads. So it's kind of like I was saying, if marketing pushes a bunch of opportunities to sales that aren't qualified or aren't, you know, aren't ready to talk to a salesperson, sales is going to hate it. They'll despise it. And so the two, you know, the two departments have to agree on a common set of behavior that indicates buying intent. And so it looks like this. You know, this is, this is an example of, uh, you know, the latent behavior, active behavior. These aren't necessarily in industry um, best practice terms. This is just what this one uh, content vendor chose to, to use. But you can see there with the pricing page is, uh, you know, it's 10 points. Watching a demo, a detailed demo is 10 points. And there's different, there's different scores, um, you know, for different actions. Like visiting the careers page, for example, probably not your customer, right? It's probably not someone in your ideal persona. Um, that's someone who wants to work for you. So that, that should, that should uh, detract from their lead score. It shouldn't add to it. So, you know, and once, and there's also a lead threshold. So if they're working to 50, we, you know, 50 points, that lead is marketing, or that lead is marketing qualified and then should go to sales. Um, you know, these are the kind of things that need to be agreed upon to lead scoring. And then they have to agree on the process. So if marketing pushes leads to sales that aren't qualified, sales will hate it, like we just went over them. And then lead management happens in phases. Like I said, so marketing qualified, um, is the first one. So sales doesn't want to talk to anyone that hasn't been qualified through marketing. Then there's sales accepted. So sales will look at the different leads that are sent over, accept them, and then uh, or reject them, which happens in some cases. Then there's sales qualified. So sales has said, all right, yes, this is business we're pursuing. And that's essentially what sales qualified means, that they're actively pursuing to close that customer. Then at the end, there's close and one business. And, and it all looks like this. So, um, you know, there's a mar things start off marketing qualified. Well, marketing uses the email automation and the marketing automation we've been talking about to nurture the leads right through the buying process. We're sending them content that's answering their questions either about, um, you know, about their problems or about even about our company, depending on where they are in their buying process. And then once it gets to a certain point that marketing and sales have agreed upon, um, you know, sales will take over. Marketing will ship those guys off and say, okay, sales, it's time. And this kind of solves the, you know, the age-old conundrum that, um, you know, no one wants to talk to a salesperson until they do. So if sales tries to, you know, talk to a customer or a prospect too early in the process, they're going to check out because they're not ready yet. You know, no one, no one appreciates that. No one likes that. And um, this really helps marketing warm the leads up and get the prospective customers ready to talk to sales where they're in a place that, okay, having a conversation about signing a contract or making a purchase uh, makes sense at this point. So, you know, the lead management process, it has a lot of moving parts. And it's not, um, it, it, I'd be remiss to say that it's simple, but that it's something that um, you can just snap your fingers and do because it takes a lot of work between marketing and sales. But the payoff is worth it. Um, you know, it's certainly a lofty goal to strive towards. And it's worth it because we can do closed loop reporting. Because, you know, if you hook your, your CRM and your marketing automation platform up, you can now use analytics to see exactly how effective your marketing campaigns were. And so, again, kind of like creating the most personalized content history, this is some of the most advanced reporting history that marketers have ever been able to have. So we can do something like this, right? We can say, how many leads turned into closed opportunities from the newest email campaign? And so that means we can see which campaigns yield the most money. We can opti and then we can optimize our marketing spend based on the forecast. So you can see in May, if we were running that same weed nurturing campaign, that we, the gamification campaign that we looked at earlier, how many weeds did that produce that closed? Well, if, you know, produce 15 that didn't close and five that closed. So, you know, not a terrible conversion rate. Then in June, our conversion rate went down. We, we uh, produced 25 that didn't close, four that closed. And that way, we can look at these numbers and have historical data to predict what's going to happen in the future. And that's, that's essentially how sales works. That's how sales makes a lot of their forecasts based on previous data. And if you have uh, the two systems hooked up, your marketing automation and your CRM, then you're able to do this. You're able to look at these numbers, make improvements on these numbers, and really try to move towards measuring how much money marketing makes, which is, um, which is really fantastic. And so, you know, to conclude, this, uh, marketing automation, like I said, I would be, um, I'd, be, I'd be remiss to say that marketing automation at this level is simple or that it just happens, that it's easy. But um, if you can pull it off, if you can get that organizational realignment, it's, uh, it's incredibly powerful because it will it'll essentially change the way that marketing works, you know, the way that marketing works with sales. And, um, you know, that really concludes 
the presentation now. That's how you make your marketing more mature. And, you know, at that point, you get to be like Jean-Luc Picard, as played by Patrick Stewart. Uh, you win, you know. You win marketing. So in wrapping up, you can see where we've come. We've come through the, uh, the Bash and Blast stage, which, is, uh, which seems incredibly primitive um, compared to stage four and stage five with behavioral marketing and uh, email automation. So that's, we've moved throughout that entire process. Thanks, Zach. And so before we uh, get to take a few questions here, I just want to reiterate, uh, you know, no matter where you are in this process, you know, eye contact, we have a solution that's really going to grow with you and your business and fit you for what you need at the time. So, you know, if you're in stage one, two, and even in some levels of stage three, that can show you that, you know, that's where eye contact lies. That's kind of the bread and butter there uh, in terms of the features and functionalities and probably where you are with your business. Now, if you're looking at, you know, some advanced levels of stage three, moving on to four and five, and even you know whatever's out there in the ethers beyond five, that's Eye Contact Pro, right? And for those who aren't familiar, that's a, a newer uh, platform that we have uh, that we're excited to show you if you haven't already seen. Um, and that's really where you can get into you know the marketing automation and lead scoring uh, and a lot of elements. And so stage five, we don't actually we didn't want to show you an example because it, honestly that would take a really long time because that is which uh, Zach can show you on the next slide building out with our eye contact premier services. Now we're across the entire uh, platform here of the email maturity scale. So whether you're, you know, stage one to five, when you're working with your strategic advisor, your account executive, they will help you, you know, get from one stage to another and maybe even move products if that's what's necessary for you at the time. Um, and, and, you know, with stage five, that's, you know, the super advanced and that's one where it's a lot of, you know, that consultation of really building it out um, to find out, you know, how you need to, you know, uh, rank different people that you're trying to actually target. Um, so with that being said, uh, for those who uh, are not uh, aware, we do actually have a 30-day absolutely free trial uh, by going to the website you see there uh, where you can actually get a little uh, demonstration and look at iContact Pro and the platform that it is. So this is a marketing automation platform. It is separate from iContact, and with it being separate, uh, to actually activate it, you must use a different email address that's not already assigned to your existing iContact account. Um, so that's kind of something to keep in mind as you're actually uh, going in to do it. And if you want you know, more information, definitely reach out to your advisor, to your account executive, you know, someone on our support team, uh, and we can even get you set up with you know, a demo so that someone can show you more in depth uh, kind of what the platform is and how your business could particularly use it. Um, so a couple of questions here just wanted to address uh, before just kind of uh, ending everything out. Uh, somebody had a, you know, uh, a question about gathering information for segmentation, uh, sort of like surveying customers on their demographics. And I know Zach discussed you know, various elements of how you can actually segment your folks. Big one is going to be engagement. If you only have email address, engagement's a big way to go for uh, actually uh, being able to segment. But also, uh, if you have you know, the ability, we can look at uh, you know, device type, uh, but also you know, time of day. It's all those split testing elements that Zach mentioned um, that really uh, help you in your segmentation process. Uh, and as a reminder, this presentation will be uh, sent to you in the coming days, so you do have access to it for you and your team uh, if you wanted to review any of the items uh, that was on here. Um, and, you know, some people were wondering, you know, about the drip campaign uh, messages that are coming in. How do I know when I'm sending too many? You know, that's really looking at the results and kind of look, uh, monitoring that over time uh, to see, you know, are your, are the, is the engagement going down? Is it going up? Um, you know, even sometimes you can ask your, you know, your contacts in some way about their preferences. There are different methods and strategies to uh, go down that road if you want to do that as well. But definitely looking at your, your metrics is the key to that and seeing where your growth is going. And ultimately, if you're looking to uh, sell something and have a conversion happen, are the conversions happening? Because that's really what's going to be key uh, for you guys. Um, so someone has a great general question, biggest, uh, one of the biggest mistakes that we see when companies begin their email campaigns, uh, biggest one is just not planning. That's the biggest one that we see is you really have to just plan ahead and just be ready to be agile about it. You can't be stuck in one method. Uh, what happened six months ago in email is probably maybe changing in some way today, especially with the way that different internet service providers handle messages, Gmail, AOL, those guys. Uh, you definitely have to be agile and be able to make adjustments uh, as you need over time. Um, 
So I definitely wanted to be cognizant of time today as we're kind of right at the one hour mark. Uh, there's a couple of questions that I see coming in here still. Uh, we're going to try to follow up with you guys. Also, I uh, encourage you to reach out to uh, your strategic advisor, your account executive, uh, you know, regarding these specific questions. Uh, you know, definitely reference the webinar. Uh, if there was something that we went over that you needed uh, to be, you know, refreshed on. Uh, and I thank you guys for attending today. Hopefully you got some great information out of it. And uh, we'll be talking to you guys soon. Thanks so much.